It's designed to be capable of building a city on the moon or Mars. Why is the goal right now to get to Mars before the moon? We'll probably get to the moon first. I think we should build a city on the moon. The side of the moon that we never see from Earth holds terrifying secrets. Thanks to the tech genius and billionaire Elon Musk, the lunar far side has now been open to surface investigation, marking a watershed moment in the history of worldwide scientific exploration of the moon. The mission's success could provide crucial insight into Earth's only natural satellite. For instance, much is unknown about the moon's origins and early development, which may provide insight into the solar system's origins and growth. The mission will also test if we can grow things on the moon, an important step toward long-term human trips beyond Earth, and undertake the first radio astronomy experiments from the moon's far side. What are people looking for on the moon's dark side? Join us as we explore the far side of the moon and reveal its terrifying secrets. If you kept an eye on the moon for a whole month, you'd see that the man in the moon never really goes away. No matter what the moon looks like, he is always there, keeping a close eye on you from above. The reason for this is the tidal lock between the Earth and the moon. Each time it completes a revolution around the Earth, the same side faces our home planet. To distinguish between the side we can always view from Earth and the side we can never see, astronomers use the terms near side and far side. It's not even close to being the dark side. Even though we can never see it from Earth, the far side of the moon still receives sunlight and has the same phases as the near side. A dark side of the moon is a cultural construct as no one really knows what is on the moon's other side. On the near side, the man in the moon is easily recognizable due to the contrast between the dark features and the relatively bright lunar soil. Those shadowy regions on the moon's face are the result of past asteroid crashes, which released lava to darken and smooth the surface, erasing any traces of prior collisions. However, there were no lava flows caused by ancient asteroids hitting the moon's far side. A cratered surface is all that was left after the collisions. Because of this, the far side is younger, less densely cratered, and much lighter than the close side. Some astronomers have hypothesized that the difference between the two sides is due to the thinner crust on the closer side. If that were to happen, magma would have an easier time erupting on the nearby side. It is unclear, however, why the crust's thickness would differ so much across the two hemispheres, and experts were keeping their fingers crossed that Chung, Four would provide some clues. The solar system's early history was filled with conflict. Craters larger than 600 miles in diameter were left on the rocky planets when big objects like asteroids or comets repeatedly crashed into them. However, time has largely buried any traces of this turbulent history. Over billions of years, volcanoes on Earth and other rocky planets have filled in these craters. The moon's dark side has preserved a near-perfect record of its childhood, including the frequency with which ancient objects pounded its surface. Far-side rocks preserve the unwritten record of the early solar system. The planet Earth is a noisy place. Strange sounds from sources as diverse as smartphones, TV stations, power lines, electrical fences, distant lightning, GPS satellites, automobiles, Wi-Fi, and, well, radios, can be picked up by any antenna. But the moon blocks most of that noise, making the moon's far side an excellent observatory for radio astronomy. For this reason, a radio telescope on the moon's far side has long been a pipe dream of astronomers. A radio observatory on the other side might greatly benefit astronomy because radio frequencies are used to investigate everything from nearby black holes to faraway galaxies. If it turns out as planned, a lunar observatory in the future will help scientists learn more about things like the hydrogen clouds that eventually formed the first stars in the cosmos. A distant reverberation of the Big Bang could be heard, and we could observe the cosmos before the formation of the first stars. Such a signal would provide astronomers a window into the cosmos's formative years. As part of China's human spaceflight aspirations, the Chang'e 4 is equipped with an experiment to see how well plants mainly potatoes and miniature flowering Arabidopsis plants, grow on the moon. This little greenhouse is the first of its kind to travel to another planet in our solar system. China's U-22 lunar rover first reported finding an alien monolith on the moon, 
but it turned out to be just a little boulder that seemed strangely square from a distance. Despite this disappointment, the lunar robot has made other crucial findings regarding the moon's far side. U22 has revealed insights into the subsurface structure of the moon's far side and data about the lunar regolith that can only be learned by physically stirring up the dirt, in contrast to missions like NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which have generated precise mapping of the entire lunar surface. The findings may provide useful information for future U.S. and Chinese lunar exploration missions. To date, U-22 has traveled more than 2,700 feet across the 110-mile diameter von Karman impact crater in the Aitken Basin near the Moon's southern pole zone in under 25 lunar days, which is about 738 Earth days. Compared to the Mare Imbrium, which the first U-2 rover explored from 2013 to 2015, and which Luna 17 and Apollo 15 explored in the early 1970s, the U-2-2 rover discovered the landscape to be relatively flat and free of rocks. At least we have an explanation for why the little boulder, now known as Jade Rabbit, stood out so prominently on the crater's rim and created the Mystery Hut Mirage. Moreover, craters come to mind. A total of 88 impact craters with an average diameter of nearly 12 meters may be found within 50 meters of the path U-22 has followed across the moon. Most have sizes smaller than 10 meters. Scientists on Earth believe the craters were formed by ejecta from the impact that formed the Jin Yu crater to the west of the rover's landing location, and so are secondary impact craters. It is possible that the dark greenish glistening material U-22 reported as gel-like at the bottom of a crater two meters in diameter is actually rock melted together by the heat of an impact. The consistency and load-bearing qualities of the lunar regolith were determined by studying how well the wire mesh wheels of the U-22 rover clung to the regolith and how often the wheels slipped in the regolith. The regolith resembles dry sand and sandy loam on Earth, demonstrating greater bearing strength than that identified during the Apollo missions. The researchers write that the sticky quality of the lunar regolith was observed over the course of multiple lunar days, indicating that it is a regional characteristic rather than a site-specific property of a patch of regolith, and that this quality may be the result of greater and more prolonged exposure to space weathering than lunar nearside regions. Conversely, Chinese scientists may have uncovered potential water sources for moon bases in the form of billions of tons of water contained within odd glass spheres buried on the moon. The microscopic glass spherules could be so plentiful that they could hold up to 300 billion metric tons of water across the surface of the moon. They were discovered in lunar soil samples and transported to Earth by China's Chang'e 5 mission in December 2020. Impact glasses, also called microtectites, are created when meteorites smash with the moon at speeds of tens to hundreds of thousands of miles per hour, ejecting fragments of lunar crust into space. Glass beads, formed when silicate minerals are heated to molten temperatures by the impact, are strewn across the landscape like crumbs from within these plumes. Since there is oxygen in the moon's soil, the beads must also have this element. Oxygen in the molten spheres combines with ionized hydrogen atoms, protons, from the solar wind to generate water, which is then sucked within the silicate capsules. Some of the spheres eventually sink into the lunar regolith and remain buried there, their water still inside. The researchers believe that at the appropriate temperatures, some of these beads release the water into the atmosphere and onto the surface of the moon, acting as a reservoir that is gradually refilled over time. Space agencies like NASA and the China National Space Administration CNSA, may find these spheres to be a suitable source of water, hydrogen, and oxygen when they establish lunar outposts. The CNSA plans to finish its moon base by 2029 at the latest, the fifth in a series of missions designed to set the framework for future manned lunar landings. China's Chang'e 5 mission was named after a Chinese goddess of the moon, before returning to Earth in December 2020, the mission made a landing on the moon and began collecting material from its surface. Meanwhile, the discovery of a rare lunar crystal on the moon's near side has given scientists renewed optimism that they may one day be able to provide unlimited electricity to the planet.
an essential ingredient for nuclear fusion, the holy grail of nearly limitless clean energy, a form of power generation that taps into the same forces that power the sun and other stars in the galaxy, has been discovered in a lunar crystal made of a previously unknown material. China has joined the United States and the former Soviet Union as the third country to discover a new lunar mineral after the crystal was found in lunar basalt particles recovered from the moon in 2020. As the first lunar sample return mission since the 1970s, the Chinese moon mission landed in Oceanus Procellarum in December 2020. The return of over 3.8 pounds of lunar samples to Earth was successful. Minerals are crystalline elements found in nature. More than 5,000 different minerals have been identified on Earth, including ice, silicon, and diamond. Many of these same minerals have also been observed on the Moon. Phosphate Mineral Change Site, Y, was given the name Chang'e, the mythical Chinese moon goddess, by the Beijing Research Institute of Uranium Geology. The crystal is see-through and about the thickness of a human hair. It originated in an area of the Moon where volcanism was common around 1.2 BY. This crystal contains helium-3, which could provide a reliable fuel supply for nuclear fusion reactors, according to scientists. Incredibly uncommon on Earth, the element appears to be quite common on the Moon. Chang'e 6, China's planned lunar mission for 2024, will make the first effort to collect samples from the Moon's far side, which is always turned away from Earth. Scientists have not yet been able to put a price tag on such a fuel source, but it will surely be quite expensive. The crystals would have to be brought back from the moon and in big enough quantities to feed fusion reactors, which presents a problem. Helium-3 has fascinated scientists as a potential source of fuel for nuclear fusion for decades. When two light atoms combine to form a heavier one, a nuclear fusion reaction takes place naturally under conditions of high pressure and high temperature. Fusion reactions occur naturally inside stars, but humans have not yet developed a fusion reactor powerful enough to initiate the process. The European Space Agency cites helium-3 as an especially attractive element due to the fact that it generates far less nuclear waste and radiation than other elements. There is a need to reprocess spent nuclear fuel into uranium and plutonium as well as other waste products, because the existing nuclear fission process employed in nuclear power plants emits both energy and radiation. Concerns about the process's safety have led researchers to look into alternatives, such as nuclear fusion, for producing nuclear energy. Since no radioactive waste is created during the fusion process, it may be a safer and more efficient fuel source. If a new mineral is found on the Moon, it could shed light on the Moon's composition and history. However, the finding of this mineral may have more direct consequences for life on Earth. The United States' annual energy needs may be met by about 25 metric tons of helium-3, which is roughly the weight of a fully loaded space shuttle cargo bay. This suggests that helium-3 could be worth around $3 billion per ton from an economic perspective. This latest discovery could spark a race to the moon to mine for helium-3, which has been flagged by a number of commercial enterprises and countries with space programs. Powering the United States for an entire year would require only 40 metric tons of the isotope helium-3, which could be mined from the moon by locating areas where change site Y is most common. That much could be brought to Earth by one of SpaceX's starships currently under construction. There is a wide variety of volatile materials on the Moon, but only one may have significant value on Earth. If refined into fuel for nuclear fusion reactors, helium-3 from the Moon might become an important export for global energy needs. The larger picture, we need to locate and efficiently mine substantial deposits of helium-3 on the Moon for it to be possible. However, mastering fusion is a prerequisite for using it to generate clean energy on Earth, and this may never happen. The finding of change site, Y, may prove to be a watershed moment on the road to realizing the ideal of endless clean energy, as numerous groups are currently attempting to make moon mining and practical nuclear fusion a reality. It comes as no surprise that China wants to conduct a manned expedition to the moon by 2030 and establish a lunar outpost. The second largest economy in the world is spending billions to catch up to the United States and Russia in their military-run space projects. Tiangong is the crown jewel of China's space program, which has also placed rovers on Mars and the Moon. China became the third country to send humans into orbit in 2003. 
In 2019, China's unmanned Chang'e 4 rocket touched down on the moon's far side, and in 2020, a robot mission to the near side of the moon will plant the country's flag there. For the first time in more than four decades, a mission to the moon resulted in the return of rock and soil samples to Earth. In 2025, NASA's Artemis III mission will send humans back to the moon, and it will be the agency's first chance to send a woman and a person of color. NASA's Artemis program aims to develop and test technology for future travel to Mars by planning a series of more difficult flights to return to the moon and build a sustainable presence. The first of these, called Artemis 1, successfully completed an unmanned orbit of the moon in 2022. When Artemis 2 launches in November 2024, it will carry humans. NASA has partnered with Finnish mobile manufacturer Nokia to install a 4G network on the moon, which will be used as a staging area for trips to Mars. NASA's return to the moon relies heavily on the SpaceX mega rocket Starship, which has been earmarked for future missions. SpaceX is incredibly important to NASA's quest to return to the moon after 50 years. Starship is Elon Musk's massive mega rocket system intended to carry freight and crew to the moon, Mars and beyond. The Super Heavy, which consists of a spacecraft and a rocket, has been successfully tested by SpaceX. NASA will employ SpaceX's Starship, which was awarded a $2.9 billion contract in 2021 to put the first humans on the moon since 1972. In addition, Starship was awarded a contract in November 2017 to participate in the Artemis IV mission. NASA rockets will not send men to the lunar surface in contrast to the Apollo missions. The crew will take off in NASA's Orion spacecraft, which will be attached to the top of the agency's next space launch system, SLS, while a Starship will take off independently to serve as the mission's lunar lander. The crew will return to Orion on their route to Earth after completing their mission, but not before abandoning Starship in lunar orbit. This means that for the first time since 1972, NASA intends to use a rocket constructed by SpaceX, which the government commissioned. This method is useful for more than just SpaceX. In the coming years, NASA will commission 14 private businesses to transport a wide range of payloads to the moon. Three of these businesses are scheduled to deliver a shipment. With SpaceX's goal of making Starship totally reusable, it may perform many launches per year. It has the potential to drastically alter the space economy and the limits of what we can launch into orbit. Even if Elon Musk's SpaceX only managed 50 launches per year, that would be more than any other company has managed since Sputnik. Only one-third of SpaceX's annual launch objective has been met thus far. Recent technology advancements have lowered mission costs, allowing for new public and commercial sector actors to enter the current lunar space race. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.